Aloha, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. You can go to Lviv in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to Lviv in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German or Turk or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to America and become an American. Welcome back to the show. Today's guest is Brian Tao Wara, poet and author, first generation Lao American, a member of the Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans. My dear colleague, welcome to the show. Oh, so I do, and hello, aloha, and welcome to you as well, and to all of our audience members who are tuning in. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much, Brian. I'm very thrilled about this interview because you are the first poet we interview. And uh, we don't have a lot of immigrant poems and uh, we need more. We need more immigrant, immigrant author, writer, and poets. So you came to the United States in 1973, adopted by American pilot, naturalized in 1976 during the American bicentennial. Just please tell us about your family. Do you remember anything before you came to the United States? And most importantly, what is it like to grow up in the United States? Wow, that's a great complicated question, of course. Let's see. I came to the United States you know, at a very young age. I was um, less than six months old. You know, but my family had been flying in the United States as civilian pilots um, for the Lao government um, during the same time as the Vietnam War. And 1973 was the um, close of the U.S. involvement um, in that part of Southeast Asia. And so my family had been looking for a child to adopt um, at the time, and I came along with everyone. And so growing up you know, in an all-white family you know, in different parts of the United States was an interesting experience. I got to see what life was like in you know, states like Montana, Alaska, Michigan, right during you know, the rise of you know, the computer age and you know, important cases in Asian American history, such as Vincent Chin killing you know, in 1982 when laid off auto workers you know, killed Vincent Chin you know, for mistaking him for Japanese. And so all of this um, came in you know, at the same time that my family was very you know, encouraging for me to look at all the different ways that it was possible to be an American, to see you know, what it was that we were reaching for you know, with our freedoms and with you know, what we saw as our responsibilities in terms of being civically engaged, helpful to others, and, you know, and trying to make a difference in one another's lives. Thank you very much. It's, uh, the, uh, you, you came to the United in the 1970s, and that is about the same time Asian American identity is being formalized, I would say. So uh, I really appreciate your, your explanation. So you are a award-winning law American poet, and you hold over 20 literary, academic, and professional awards. 10 years ago, you were selected as a law delegate to serve as a cultural Olympian during the 2012 London Summer Games. Your writing is cited over nine international textbooks, including the Princeton Encyclopedia of Poetry and Poetics and a Historical Dictionary of Asian American Literature and Theater. You recently presented at the Library of Congress on law American literature. But my question to you is, every child is a poet. I was a point when I was a child, but a few of them decided to make it a profession. How did you become a point? Well, that's a wonderful question as well. I took a number of courses in you know, high school and in college, of course, you know, to be a poet on the one hand, but those weren't, as I often tell my colleagues, what really started me off as a um, poet. Um, I think it was that I ran into many other poets who were doing some amazing work there. And I realized I could be a part of that conversation. And in the process of exploring the possibilities, it started off a little practically, I, I'm a, I will admit that I had you know, decided to find my chances and to take that risk and to jump into you know, a campus you know, poetry contest, and I happened to win a prize from that. And I thought to myself, okay, well, maybe we can keep going at it. 
But then as I started doing that more and more often, I also started to have a chance to explore the, uh, the deeper questions, you know, which became really important as I started to explore my own sense of identity, my sense of heritage, not only who we have been, but who we can become. And so poetry was so important you know, for us because you know, when you're dealing with so many elements of American history that don't get taught in the classrooms, mm -hmm. for example, you know, particularly Asian American history, then sometimes the stories that you come across come to you in a nonlinear fashion. You might get a story from the 1980s one day, a story from the 1970s the next. And so the poems at least allowed you to start capturing you know, those moments as they came. And maybe one day you'd have enough to put it into a more traditional prose you know, order you know, and to figure out what's going on with you know, the story of our journeys. Very well said. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, you authored eight books so far. I only authored seven. So you are, you are hard, much more hardworking. And, but your work appear in more than 100 publications globally, including Australia, Canada, England, Scotland, Germany, France, Singapore, Hong Kong, Korea, Chile, Pakistan. And your writing has been translated into so many different languages. I can't believe uh, that when, when I read your bio, Spanish, French, German, J Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Thai, uh, Tagalog, uh, Bengali and Lao. I, I confess that I read a lot of translated literature, mostly in European languages and the Japanese. But just since I understand English, I don't read translation from English anymore. My question to you is, can literature, particularly poetry, be translated? Can you poem, poems be translated? You know, I think of that question a lot of consideration. And I think about the um, Chinese American poet Arthur Z, who always mentions the Italian notion that to translate is to betray, that you can't help it, that you always get something a little off. And the way I talk to my students about it when I'm talking about you know, writing poetry is you look at something like the haiku of Basha, where it's just you know, less than 17 syllables about a frog splashing into a pond and already they're over. 400 translations you know, in English alone in, and also in other different languages. So I always say to myself, then, you know, you know just such a simple premise. I mean, there's so many ways to read it and to interpret it, but that's you know, actually a joyous thing that we can explore and see all the different ways we can express something. As for my own poetry, I find that you know, it's challenging to translate it you know, for many people because I happen to be doing a project of trying to figure out you know, much like Milton in the aftermath of the English Civil War, trying to figure out you know, what are the words that you know, we needed to you know, capture our experience, to you know, capture our journey. It's possible in many instances, those words don't exist. And in other cases, you have to ask yourself, you know, what are the words in Mao you know, that can be added into the English vocabulary? Then, and someone said, oh, Brian, it's like, you know, why do people need to think about what words in Mao might be added and just go, mm -hmm. Well, you know, if we can add an important word like caucus or sushi, or we can add a premise like a ninja, for example, to the American vocabulary, you, know, you can you know, add bagels and croissants, then surely, you know, as we go through our own experience, then we can ask ourselves, you know, what can sub ID mean to someone? It's like, you know, what does you know, it mean to be jai, to be happy, and to explore that? Does that mean that that'll catch on like hasta la vista, baby? Who can tell? But that's the uh, joy of the American experience, Then is that we get the chance to, and the freedom um, to try it out and see who it fits for some, if not everyone. Excellent. I, I would say that you sound both like a poet and also a literary critic because you put a lot of theoretical thinking into your uh, literary practice. As Chief Justice uh, John Roberts, you know, because I'm a lawyer, I like to quote judges. Chief yeah. Judge John Roberts once said, as a jurist, I don't read law review articles because they are irrelevant to the judicial process and the law practice. But what about the literary practice? Do you, as a point, read literary theory and literary criticism? And you, you, you write and you create, and, but do you care about the theory and the criticism? 
Well, that's a wonderful question. And I think the um, disappointing answer for many people will be that um, I will take a glance at it, but I try not to um, take it too deeply, too seriously then. To quote the um, old American film, The Big Lebowski, um, then when Jeff Bridges goes, that's just your opinion, man. <laughs> That's my theme. <laughs> yeah, the problem that I find is that particularly as we work with um, historically underserved um, communities and audiences or communities who are refugees, immigrants, and so on, in my own community's case, in 45 years, we had fewer than um, 45 books by a community of nearly half a million. Uh, mm -hmm. And so in this case, I said to myself, um, if we spend so much time on literary criticism or literary theory, for example, we'll be second guessing ourselves trying to create these perfect texts, you know, then for a community that's already changing, a, re a readership that's already changing, that's not Lao, that's not Asian American. And that's an interesting premise then. But I said, no, the more important thing is that we just all have to start getting our stories out there to value what we have. And maybe over time, we'll think of a better way to say what we have. But no, the number one important thing right now is that as we see so many stories about elders, our families, our friends and neighbors being lost, which could utterly transform life in America and even arguably across the globe, I think we owe it to ourselves you know, to just try and to write. It's like, no, if it happens to fit within an existing theory or an emerging theory of any given point in the day, then that's great. But if it doesn't, well, that's all right. You still have written something. And, uh, you know, then we'll just have to wait for the scholars to come up with the idea of where your writing fits in into the world. Look at Stephen King, for example, mm -hmm. out over in Maine. Um, when, you know, people used to think, oh, this is just junk fiction. This is, um, this is trashy literature. No one should be writing like this. Mm -hmm. And now, oh, it's like, no, now he's teaching classes at Ivy League schools and everything else like that because, you know, like no one picks up a book saying, oh, he doesn't have a doctor. No one picks it up thinking um, that he's got these fancy degrees. It's like, so true. We have to give ourselves permission to try and to share the best we can from our experiences. So true. And what you just said is two quick comments. And one is Stephen King. It's one of my favorite authors. And his book about writing really actually was very helpful in my own you know, writing, uh, craft my writing. And uh, I, I still love uh, Stephen's, uh, uh, one of my favorite Stephen's quote was, uh, Donald Trump is, a, is scarier than any of the horror novel I have ever written. And the second about the, uh, the narrative and the, the, the collective efforts, uh, uh, just remind me what Viet Nguyen, the Vietnamese author mentioned, uh, once discussed, narrative plentitude. So we do need a, a mass, you know, particularly for the underrepresented groups, uh, Southeast Asian uh, literature, there are plenty out there, but uh, it's not appeared in plentitude. So we should push for narrative plentitude to be recognized. I appreciate your insights. You have done your job. You have done your job terrifically. You served twice as president of the Science Fiction Poetry Association. And uh, I want to hear a little bit more about that. And you established the Law American Writer Summit in 2010 to support emerging authors. You advocate nationally on clean, uh, clearing unexploded weapon from the Vietnam War and currently contaminate over 30% of the laws 50 years later. So uh, your, your title on our show is Point, Author, and Advocate. I think that is quite accurate to, de to describe your, your role. Please tell us more about your activism and how it works with your literary work. Uh, President JFK once said, if more politicians knew poetry and more poets know politics, I'm convinced that the world would be a little bit better place in which to live. What's your comments? Ah, that's a Excellent question, and I think JFK has it right. I think at the same time, there's always been a conversation in our community that, um, you know, when you mix you know, poetry and politics, you either get bad poetry or you get bad politics, and in worst cases, you get both, and I think that's a little bit cynical. I find myself saying that, in fact, um, the poets are essential to democracy, 
Um, and and you know, if you really want kind of a canary in a coal mine to see how well your democracy is functioning, you need to see what's happening for poets and how they're making their way through your community, through your society. As poets, for example, we don't really have um, a lot of um, setup requirements, say, compared to um, a old dance and choreography you know, show, you know, a music concert or anything else like that. Oftentimes, it's a very solitary experience. Just you may be a traveling companion or so, you know, then, and you're going through all levels of society, from the very wealthy to the very you know, poor. We serve as the eyes of our community. And, and you know, at the same time, I think that comes with that responsibility you know, to use our poetry to you know, speak against injustice, to um, advocate for the best of what we're reaching for, even if we imperfectly reach for that. You know, I think the question was that you know, occurred to me is that I've seen a great many you know, prose writers write very eloquently about you know, the issues that concern them most. But as we saw, you know, in my own work, then you know, time and time again, I felt that I've made some of the most effective change, you know, being able to you know, capture something in 15 to 30 seconds. So the uh, poet Lee Young Lee used to talk about it a lot, that uh, line per line, inch per inch, more of a human soul is compressed into a line of poetry than in any other literary form. And I tend to agree with that. That you know, although I talk a lot about it, that in the end, in the final equation, what makes it onto the page and the paper, you have to be kind of you know, that laser point you know, precision then. You know, and at the same time, you have the ability for that poem to speak to the present as well as to the future. I actually had a great conversation the other day with some friends of mine, but I have come to view poetry as a bit of a time traveler mm -hmm. in that you know, once you write it down, a, a really good poem, the type of poem that um, changes your life and that changes your um, community and even arguably your nation or your world is one that you know, meets the needs of the people you know, at this particular point in time, but it will also come again um, and people will find your poem when they need it most, oftentimes when you least expect it, centuries later, decades later, you name it, but you know, that's the joy of the journey. Absolutely. It's, it's one, a wonderful experience in reading poetry. I. I... I uh, started my, uh, you know, every child was a poet or every child was an author. I, I wrote a lot of uh, poem when I was a, a teenager. As you, now looking back, I said, wow, that's pretty good. It's, uh, mm -hmm. I, I probably wouldn't be able to write it that good, you know. But, but the poetry is still pretty uh, different. It's, uh, and uh, looking at different literary genre, you know, poetry, uh, uh, poetry. Uh, I say, you know, uh, and uh, uh, novella, novel, uh, you know, non fiction, non fiction. Look at all of these different. Uh, why you choose a uh, poem and to be your primary tool to express yourself as an author? Mm. That's a great question. I think there are many reasons why. I think it was that poetry was the form that as we were rebuilding our lives in the aftermath of the, of the Laos Civil War and the Southeast Asian Wars of the 20th century, I think the um, question that came to mind as I was doing um, work in our community rebuilding um, with my fellow refugees and immigrants was that you know, a lot of focus was being given to preserving and recovering the traditional arts um, at the time. Dance, music, theater, all the complicated arts then, but at the same time, I saw that there was very little work you know, being done with people trying to really strongly advocate for the role of poetry in our lives. And you know, that was something where I guess I saw that uh, you know, history has um, shown that in this time, uh, that what we're you know, seeing, you know, certain things are going to always come up, that you're going to have. Um, Let's see, the memoirs come up and we have a lot of people writing you know, their, their short stories, their movies about you know, their family's journey. But the question is, is what's you know, going to you know, be the future that we can see ourselves in? How do we imagine that? And that's where the, uh, the poetry journey came in. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Every point is a time traveler. I agree. And you moved to Minnesota in 1998 to work on Southeast Asian refugee issues and arts. 
and very, we are very fortunate to have you serve on the Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans. Do you have travel plan? Do you consider Minnesota your permanent home? Yeah, I absolutely consider Minnesota my home. I think um, it was something that you know, after um, coming there, uh, Minnesota gave me a um, chance to see um, my life and my community in a way that I hadn't you know, initially considered even all the possibilities that I had grown up with um, in Minnesota. It was a chance to see that those dreams could come true, that um, the uh, community out there really cared for one another. And I, it's like, you know, Minneapolis, you know, where, and especially North Minneapolis, where I've lived for the better part of my you know, time in Minnesota, has its challenges, but every great city has its challenges, as I told mm -hmm. one of my students on top of that follows, but I don't think a city ever really becomes a city until it's produced its first poets. Oh, and I agree. The, uh, you know, because people will take pictures of your city all the time. They will make a little home videos and you know, you know even write stories about it. But it's when you take that time out to, you know, to make a poem, then that's, something, then that's something special. And especially for Asian Americans in our community and for um, voices who are just starting to add their families' journeys into it. It becomes all the more important. We may pass by that cherry spoon over in, um, over by the highway um, day in and day out, for example. And, you know, it's not just a landmark. The question is, how do you use your poems? How do you use your stories to make that a part of um, your community's adventure, your community journey? You know, yeah, what are the landmarks that we have? And... You know, you know, you think about those old songs, right? Like, do you know the way to San Jose? Or I left my heart in San Francisco, for example. Yes. What's the song that you associate with Minneapolis? What's the song that you associate with the other cities in Minnesota? And you know, from an Asian American perspective, even an Al American perspective, so many different voices um, still have a chance to um, try and make that uh, poem, that song that really speaks to us all. Uh, mm -hmm. Carl Sandberg talks about Chicago, the uh, our culture of the world. It's like, no, the question is, is that, you know, what do we associate or what do we connect with Minneapolis? And I think there are a great many candidates already, but there's still room for so many more. Brilliant. I, I love Minneapolis. I love Twin Cities. And that is my home too. I, I plan to retire here and die here. And I'm glad you make me for the home. Uh, we normally end up our show with two questions to our mm -hmm. distinguished guest. The quest, uh, question one is advice. Question two is recommendation. So question mm -hmm. one, if you were to give your advice to yourself in your 20s, time travel permitted, what would you say? I'd say take more of those risks soon. It's OK. That, mm -hmm. you know, that part of part of being a good part of America is that you take that risk, you know, that uh, like that's, um, and that you dare to reach for something great. Mm -hmm. right? And once you give yourself a chance, you know, door, amazing doorways open up for you, and you learn a lot, both from your failures and your successes. Mm -hmm. Great advice. And uh, that may I add that uh, what you just said is remind me. President Biden once said, "If I can." Uh, summarize the United States in one word, possibilities. Mm. And uh, take a calculated risk is also the same advice we hear from our previous uh, guest, an Indian American uh, executive. But I think probably take a calculated risk in the United States might be rewarding and uh, a uh, in a positive way, but to take a calculated risk or take, even take any risk in an uh, uh, authoritarian regime or somewhere else might not be a very good idea. So that's the difference between the United States and the rest of the world. Anyway, mm -hmm. the last question we have for you is, I'm not going to ask if you have any specific author or point influenced you because that I believe that one particular author influenced another particular author is, is nonsense. You know, everybody has, you know, uh, uh, absorb, you know, the uh, classics and from contemporaneous as well. But I was wondering if you have any favorite author, favorite point, mm -hmm. and I would like to recommend it to our audience. I've been thinking about that question all month long. Really, okay. Really <laughs> yeah. 
And it's like, you know, and I think it would be too long to rattle it off. And I'd also have too many living poets and authors coming after me if I didn't mention them <laughs> on it there. And in fact, I think I'm going to actually give uh, my better advice um, for everyone for this would just simply be, I love poetry and poetry has been the leading you know, dynamic of my life for over 30 years as a writer now. And the thing that I would say is that much like uh, Mark Twain says, I never let education or school stand in the way of a good education. Um, so too, the thing is that I would tell readers, don't give up on poetry, that you may run into a poem you don't think that you like or that you don't get right now, and that's all right. A lot of us run into those poems, but the thing is, is that like a good newspaper then, and just keep looking around and the odds are you will find a poem and a poet whose work speaks to you. And if you don't, then go ahead and you know, try your own hand at it and add to that great conversation. Mm -hmm. There's you know, poems about baseball, there's poems about hockey, there's poems about science fiction and you know, poems about you know, just getting a um, good clam chowder you know, out there. You know, you'd be surprised what kind of verse um, can change your life if you let it into your life. You know, so it's not always perfect, but it's worth exploring and that and that's part of the greater thing. It's not always about finding the one perfect poem for your life, but it's about finding the joy in looking. And that's you know, can make all the difference. Excellent point. For me, poetry is time to travel. It, it, a po poem is primarily related to time. And just what your poetry, I, I read some of them and uh, I was blown away. And I can't memorize them, but uh, just to remind me, my uh, one of one of the short poem I read long time ago when I was young, I couldn't understand the meaning. Now I'm uh, uh, middle ages. Now I quite understand uh, time and have a strong sense of time. And your poetry reminded me a lot about, you know, the the, the poem, the short poem I read long time ago. I'd like to share with you is from Salvador Salvadore, mm. Aldo. Everyone stands alone at the heart of the world, pursed by a ray of sunlight. And suddenly it's evening. Of course, the original was in Italian. Hmm. Uh, and this is an English translation, but uh, it's, it's pretty accurate, I would say. And suddenly it's evening and uh, it's time. Poetry make us immortal. Poetry make time froze. And I really appreciate you bringing a poem, a, a point, and a writing poem, and also advocate for the underrepresented. It's a, quite a thrill to have you on the show, Brian. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.